Christian and Dolph from the Datsuns. Welcome to Australian Musician. Oh, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you for having us. Guys, let's go way back. When you started this band and you were discussing music, were, were there one or two albums in your music collections that everyone in the band had? That's no. a good question. <laughs> That's I don't a very, think so. very long time ago. Yeah, it is a very long time ago. I don't think we ever discussed anything. Yeah? I think it was all just like, oh, I've got this kind of idea. It goes like this or blah, blah. And I think in those days, we didn't have enough money to all uh, have the same record. Like we were just, I got this record. So, oh, you should get the other one then. Yeah. And in that way, we could all partake uh, in, I mean, <laughs> in whole catalogs. Oh, yeah. I've got this record. So you should get the first one or, or whatever it may, it may be. Right. I, I literally had records as in vinyl. And one of the main reasons I had them is because you could get them cheaper from secondhand record stores and CDs at the time. So, you know, m money was an issue back then. Yeah. So you weren't, being, you weren't being like a, uh, what do you call it, um, audio file or anything, Christian? No, it's just the records were cheaper. And yeah. my dad had an old record player. So I'd buy things, go around the record stores and buy things. And then, oh, yeah. you know, there's like, well, I think also that was a good way of getting albums that you couldn't get because what people forget now is like, say, in the late 80s, early 90s, there were some albums that just weren't in print anymore at that time. You know, or hadn't been some bands hadn't been repressed on CD, so you could get copies yeah. of albums on vinyl that you couldn't get in, in the stores or anything like that, and they were cheaper. So mm. they had lots of things on vinyl for those two reasons alone. Mm. Yeah. And what were the goals way back then when you started the band? <laughs> we, I mean, well, we I didn't mean, really think like that. There was no goals. Well, yeah. things like we like playing music and we want to play music and here's some other guys who like to play music we're the only people in the small town to play with so let's play mm. together and make some music but i think like uh because christian's he's a few years older than i am and he he could already play and i was already when phil and i started playing together the big guitar player he um both of i both of us didn't know how to play we we didn't know how to play music at all so we're like oh yeah let's have a band or whatever it's like okay well, what does this what does this do and then so when christian started playing with us he was like quite far ahead of us so it was like oh you can do that or whatever or like have you tried doing this chord before that kind of thing yeah, yeah. so fast forward to 2021 and uh, you're you've released your seventh album eye to eye um You've been playing around with these songs uh, for quite some time. Um, were most of them written and recorded before the pandemic? Yes, well, well before. We started making this record in 2016, was it, Christian? Yeah. Start of 2016, and we kind of, we had uh, roughly an album's worth of uh, bare bones kind of ideas, and we went into the studio and goes, okay, it goes like this. And then over a weekend, we kind of put down backing tracks uh and then everyone who kind of went to their various corners of the world christian's in london i'm in sweden the other guys were are in new zealand and then we thought oh geez uh that needs more i want to play around with that a little bit more so there's a lot of uh oh, i want to change this guitar part or um especially myself with with uh with the vocal arrangements and lyrics and everything i was I was not really ready to do it at the time. So it took me, uh, yeah, about a year or two of like playing around with different ways of doing things to be quite happy with it. But also, you know, we're all playing in different bands and having different musical kind of things going on. And I've got two small children. So it was instead of being like, this is my main focus, it would be like, oh, can I find some time this month to work on this? So, you know, I say years, but, you know, it probably was, wasn't that long in reality. Yeah. Hope that makes sense. Because you were sitting with the songs for so long, is it a different feeling having them released now as opposed to, you know, fresh out of the can? Yeah, Do I answer this yeah, yeah, yeah it, it really is. I mean, it was a long gestation to get the album done and sort of following up from what Joel said, it was all done, the bones of it were done in a very short space of time. It was kind of like we had a canvas and we splattered a whole bunch of paint over it. And then we spent several years trying to turn this kind of mess of paint into uh, a picture that we liked. And so 
having such a long period over which we refined it definitely left a different vibe from some of the other records where we went in you know recorded the album and then immediately went on tour and it was released very quickly because it's kind of more fresh and that way whereas this time there was a lot more time for kind of uh, introspectively looking at it or thinking about it a lot which in some ways led to a lot of good things we were able to add a lot more color and layers to the songs that we might not have if we had to rush through it and so you ended up with a very different vibe on the record I think you know because also because on top of taking so long to actually finish the record we then ran into the pandemic which further stretched out the time that it took to release things so that add, definitely added a whole different vibe to the album as well it was more a sense of um you know uh, uh usually things happen very fast getting a record released this time it was such a long time that it was a sense of um relief when we finally got it out you know because <laughs> it took so long to get done rather than like uh, usually oh we've got to get it out by this time because we've got the tour booked and we have all these promo dates sorted out it was nothing like that it was kind of like sort of surmounting the odds kind of feeling trying to get it out yeah how was your cutoff valve? Was it hard to let it go and say it's finished? <laughs> there was no real yeah, cutoff, I mean, as it were. I think, uh, well, I think there's always that kind of problem. But like Christian said, when you've got like a tour schedule or when you have someone kind of saying, you know, this is the, your deadline, then that's kind of it. But when you all have like your home studios and uh, you know you can't tour because of, like small children and sort of things like that. It's kind of easy to say, oh, I want to try this, I want to try this. And I'm always really scared of overthinking things and overdoing things. I think we found a pretty good balance in the end. Sometimes, you know, you try all these things and you come back full circle to the first thing you did. I think there's some vocals, for instance, on the record that was scratch vocal that I did, you know, way back, but I didn't better that idea. So we just went back to that. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely a little more production on this record, I guess. Yeah, mm. um, because there, there, there were some songs, sorry, like there were some of the songs from the initial set, uh, session that were done very quickly that then later on kind of turned into something else quite different because we had so much time to think about it. We were able to take different approaches to the songs that we may not have done if we were just doing it all in the studio in a very short space of time, which was beneficial. Yeah, yeah. There, there are various tempos on the songs uh, on this album. We're, were most of the songs recorded in the tempo that they were written or, or do you fiddle around with them, speed them up, slow them down? Oh, never anything that drastic. Now they're always pretty much, they're always the same. Um, and usually we record to tape. So uh, there's no like kind of, there's click tracks here and there on the record, but it's like, we don't really record to a grid or anything like that where you can just things around. I think there was one song we were like, oh, that's a little slow. And when we dumped it into Pro Tools, we just very sped the tape machine a little bit. And then I re-sang it so I didn't sound like a chipmunk. Yeah, I can't even remember what song that was. Other People's Eyes. Oh. I thought it was just like a hair too plotty. So mm. old school though. Tape machine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think up. you re I think you replayed the guitar so then they would be in like a standard, you know, tune pitch or whatever. Yeah, you know. redid the guitars, yeah. Because yeah. I know it bothers you because we have one song on our first record that's very sped. Oh. Like the, the master is very sped. Yes. And um and you're like really annoyed because you can't play along with it. It was like a quarter of a step up or something. Keys. Yeah. yeah. It's in between keys. <laughs> uh, let's talk a bit about the uh the gear that was used on the album. Um Dolph, uh, tell me about the bass gear that you used on the album. Uh, it's all over the place. I think a lot of it is uh a, 64 Thunderbird, uh, Gibson Thunderbird. It's a single pickup, so it's a, I think it's called a Thunderbird 2. Um, I really like that. I've had it, um, I've always played Thunderbirds, but I've had that one since 2003, 2004, and that's been my main guitar for a long time. Um, I don't know, it's got kind of a very wooden y kind of sound, I guess. And I, the thing about those uh, Thunderbird 2s is that because I just have one pickup, it's kind of, you can't get a Thunderbird 4 and just turn off the uh, the bridge pickup. It's not in the same position. It's kind of in between. Um, and I, I just really like that. It's, sometimes I think there's too much treble on bass guitars and I, I don't like it. So I, I kind of like this kind of uh, middle position. I also use, uh, I think they're called pressure wound strings. 
Okay. So it's kind of um, in between a flat wound and a, a round wound. And you can put those on and, and record straight away. You know, sometimes if you put on uh, like bright round wound strings, at when you, the day you record, you get this kind of very metallic kind of top that you, that sounds awful, I think, when you record. Um, and then I think I might have used, I have another uh, Thunderbird 2, but it's a non reverse. Um, and that has like a slightly higher high gain pickup uh, output. Yeah. Um, I think that's pretty much. It. I might have used um, I might have used a uh, a Moserite here and there. Uh, I don't know if it's like a Japanese copy or if it's if it's a real one. It doesn't say Ventures on it, just says Moserite, but it has Moserite pickups. And, uh, it's really good because I'm I'm not very good with the palm muting, but it has this uh, dampener. You can just kind of screw down and it does all the work for you. And, and what do you play through? Um, I'm usually playing through, uh, I have this, I used to play through orange stuff live. Um, I usually, it's like a, what do you call it? A, uh, the 8200? Yep. And I think it's, I don't think it's a Mark III, I think it's a Mark II and I've had those for 20 years almost. Mm. Uh, oh. I like those because they don't have very many knobs. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's gain, master, treble, mid, bass, and I'm usually need... of the school that the, the the less number of knobs, usually the better the thing sounds. That's a pretty good rule of thumb. I also have this Fender uh, Super Bassman that I use sometimes too. Yeah. And Christian, what did you use mainly? Uh, well. It was interesting because you typically what I would usually use, I prefer like Gibson guitars. I usually use a Les Paul and a lot of the time the most the amp I use the most is a, a Marshall 50 watt uh, plexi. So the non master volume hits and for the initial sessions and all the stuff that I recorded at, at my home studio, we can call it that that was done with primarily that guitar and amp and then a selection of pedals. But I also went to Sweden where Dolph lives and did quite a lot of O-dubs there. And basically there for logistics and budget purposes, I just used whatever we had on hand when we went there. So it was an interesting experience because I went out of my comfort zone and would use literally whatever amp we turned up in the studio was here today or whatever guitar was hanging on the wall. So we kind of for the overdubs. There were lots of things that I can't even remember. Somebody else's guitar, somebody's amp. I can remember. Tubes. You know. that, it was, I think we got your Les Pauls most of the time. Yeah. Uh, and you used my Gaia tone. Which is in Japanese. It's a 60s, yeah, 60s Japanese guitar. With, it's single coils, but they're very high output. And they're like the highest output pickup I've ever heard. <laughs> I think they might have these stack comebackers or something. It's like a surf guitar with like metal guitar output. You know, I think we might have used that a couple of times. And then there was like a small Fender amp. Um, that we use because Vibralux. Vibralux. Yeah. Which but which is so like using a guitar tone into a, a Vibralux is like that's really out of my comfort zone. But it was like whatever sounded good was good, you know. So it was kind of interesting to go from starting off using the things I know very well and then at the end of the record using just all these kinds of different things that I don't never normally use. But in the end it weirdly all sounds like me. So I'm not really sure what that yep. says about yeah. <laughs> You guys uh, emotionally attached to some of your instruments. Do you have sentimental stories to acquiring uh, your guitars, or, or are they just tools? I think um, oh, you go. Uh, uh, for me, I don't collect guitars. I only have a small number of guitars, and most of them I've had for decades. So on one hand, you could say I'm sentimentally attached, but on the other hand, they really are to me just tools. Like they're not in pristine condition. They're not collector's items. They're very well worn, scratched and dented. And, you know, like, I don't really care if that happens to them. So I'm kind of a weird mishmash of sentimental and they're just pieces of wood that I used to make sound. I think if something happened to those guitars that you weren't responsible for, you would be upset. Oh, yeah, I would. But at the same time, like yesterday, I, I took a chunk out of the back of one of them, putting it on a stand. I was just like, eh. Oh, so wow. it's kind of, a, it's a weird, you know, it's all or nothing. But yeah, if somebody else smashed one, I yeah, I'd probably would be much more upset than I think I would be, for sure. I think I, I've got a fair number of uh, guitars and instruments in general. But I, 
Yeah, I think the, the ones that I've had around for a while and the ones that have been around since the mid-60s or whatever, I kind of feel some kind of stewardship over. I mean, I still treat them pretty badly, but I still, I don't know. I, yeah, I feel pretty attached to them. Like you like it to look, you're very particular about them looking uh, original in the sense if you have to replace something, you want it to be, you know, yeah, like I mean, originally. When I first started playing, I would play these reissue Thunderbirds, you know, late 80s, I think kind of reissues and 90s ones and all the uh, they got a slightly uh, shorter headstock I guess for the neck dive um, and uh, small hardware and it's that's in like black hardware and black pickups and uh, I'm really not into that at all I want them to look like the 60s ones yeah it's, uh, yeah I've had some stuff weird. replaced on them before and it looks, it looks awkward yeah um, this it's quite I think we're quite People will get, I've been asked about gear a lot over the years and we've, I've done guitar magazines and things, different things, and also talk to other members of other bands about gear. And as a band, we're not the kind of band that's sort of around talking about gear. So it's kind of a bit weird for us to talk about gear compared to like, I know other guitar players and they're way more into discussing what pickups they use or what string gauge or what things they plugged in. When we make music as a band, we don't really talk about that stuff as much as some other bands. It's just like, you know, does this sound good? I yeah. think Christian pretty much sounds like Christian no matter what he's playing. <laughs> a bit like or we've worse. talked about before, you know, sometimes I've given him uh, some of my guitars on a record because I said, oh, everything you play sounds too, on this, you sound too good. Like, your your playing's too easy. You can bend the stuff too easy. So I gave him my guitar with the, the strings were like, I don't know, heavy, like much heavier gauge. He's like, oh, it really hurts when I play. And I said, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Struggle. Yeah, I want to hear the struggle a little bit. Yeah. Oh, one piece of gear that we do have to talk about is the eye to eye uh, analog phaser question that you built. Yes, we do. I do. I've got the, the prototype. That's the prototype that we did. Hang on a second. Look what I have right here. He's got the real deal. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, we did that because um, that's actually the third pedal that we've done. The, the previous two records, we also did a pedal, um, two fuzz pedals, the Death Rattle Fuzz and the Bad Taste Fuzz, named after the album and then a song from the previous album. And so we decided to do uh, another limited edition pedal, but we wanted to do something a bit different this time, having done a couple of fuzz pedals. So we decided to do a phaser because... Uh, Phil in particular, the other guitar player, is a big fan of phaser pedal and uses it a lot, especially live. So we decided it would be interesting to uh, do a phaser and I've never built one before. So it was uh, quite a journey to get it done. Yeah. So tell me about the four settings on it and what, and what they do. Uh, well, you can do quite a few different things. It's like a classic, what's called an OTA style of phaser, which is a very 70s four stage kind of phaser. And uh, when you get kind of 70s space, you know, like basically they used to just have a speed knob. Um, and so we, I wanted to take that kind of 70s style and sort of add a few different controls and different things to it. One of the things that it did that you sometimes but don't always get on those kinds of phases is an actual mix control, not a depth control, but, a, you know, blends between the clean signal and the actual just phase signal. And so that was quite interesting to add that to a 70s kind of style of phase because you can get a lot of different sounds or in between settings that you can't typically get with that sort of four stage phaser. So we did that, uh, extended the speed sort of range, uh, added volume, which is something I don't use on phaser, but quite a few people, particularly if you look at like a more old school guitar players would use phasers for solos and things. So it was quite interesting to, I wanted to actually add a boost so you could use it, you know, just kick it on for solos. and then the one mode control, we added a sweep range, which changes the range of where the frequencies start and finish for when, when you're going through the phase. So basically the idea was to take sort of a, a very old school kind of sounding phaser and make it a little more versatile and then make something that looked really cool and fit in with the album artwork. Yeah. So was the pedal used on the album or, or did the pedal come later? The pedal came later actually, because it was after we'd done the record and we're like, yeah, there's quite a bit of phaser on here that we decided to um, do the phaser. Yeah. One thing I just, sorry to interrupt. 
what, one thing, I don't know if you intended on doing this, but this is rate knob, so you can sort of invert that, right? Like from- You can spread the range further. Yeah, exactly. But if you have it in the middle setting, yes, I've found that you can get this kind of like fixed wire kind of thing happening, which yeah. I think sounds fantastic. Yeah, that but was intentional. I don't know why. It's, yeah, if you stop, it stops the LFO from sweeping. So it gets stuck at a certain point in the frequency range. And then you can change that with the sweep controls. It's kind of like a weird semi resonant filter in a fixed position, which is quite interesting to use when you, if you're recording multiple guitar tracks, you could use that and sweep the range and leave it in one position on each of them. So they would be stacked in different points in the frequency range for overdubs. Yeah. Christian, how do you approach your guitar solos in the studio? Do you record a shitload of them or do you like to get them fresh and early? <laughs> That's the technical term there, is <laughs> a shitload. Uh, normally, extremely unprepared, go in and yeah, basically record a few takes and then like, usually like will be a comp. So like, oh, the first half of this one was pretty good with the second half of that one. And then maybe, oh, that one note was a bit off. So we'll just, you know, fix it up. But it's very much a receive your pants approach um never like really sit down and work anything out or anything like that so it's basically me doing a few takes Dolph usually telling me that it should be more wild and then we do a comp and then it's done yeah, uh, yeah I had, that's when I hand on the guitar with the heavier gauge strings <laughs> yeah it needs to be well, more wild yeah, but, usually the my, <laughs> but my, usually my job I think if I can add this in is to tell him stop working it out because he'll he might come up with a kind of a, like quite a, a hooky phrase or something. And it's like, okay, we can keep one of those, but don't work out the whole thing. You know, and usually it's kind of nice to have that kind of uh, yin and yang of like him just kind of freestyling and then uh, ending either in, yeah, a repeated phrase that you would still do live, for instance. Because That's the thing, whenever we do a record and then we have to go out and play, there's always like a few bits I have to go back and like, what what was I playing there? I should probably play that bit because that's like the start and the end of the solos is what the audience know. You can do whatever you want in the middle as long as you finish and start <laughs> like a record. So I have to go back and figure out what was I doing? How did I play yeah, that? Because I mean, you are improvising and so, but they do become like signature or like hooks yeah. within the song so yeah you're obliged to do that unfortunately it's <laughs> definitely true because there's been a few times over the years where i tried to oh well i just live i did something completely different and afterwards people were like well, what you didn't do that bit from the solo you're like you know whatever what happened to that bit or whatever so i was like oh okay i guess you have to do the key bits otherwise people are disappointed yeah. and but figuring out what the key bits is <laughs> sometimes takes some time yeah. So when was the last time the Datsuns played live? No, uh, I think it was 2018. Was it? Or was it 2019? No, it was probably, I, I was going to say 2017. No, it wasn't. It was 2018. We went to New Zealand and we were in Japan mm. uh, for some shows. And then, yeah, we kind of finished off the tracking of the record that year and then mixed it the next year, ready to come out in 2020. And then, of course... Now we're kind of stuck right. in this, um, you know, purgatory for a while. Yeah. yeah, we were booking a tour, planning to book a tour and trying to get stuff together when it first hit. So obviously all that was postponed slash cancelled, yeah. which is yeah. very frustrating. Dolph, you're in Sweden, which has been a bit of a, a social experiment for the rest of the world. Uh, Sweden so. tackled the <laughs> pandemic in a different way. What's the situation now? Man, I... I, I don't know, to be honest. It feels like uh, I don't I don't want to, I don't, yeah, I don't want to uh, speculate anything because I don't really know, but it, it seems to be doing okay here. I know uh, at the beginning, things were pretty bad. Uh, I've been, I've had both my vaccinations now, so I'm fully vaccinated. And most people might, I'm 40-ish, 42 now. Most people my age around, and my wife too, she's 39. Yeah, most people that age have kind of had are fully vaccinated now and people are kind of getting on with it. I don't, I always wear a mask uh, when I'm on public transport and at the supermarket and things like that, but I don't see that many other people doing it, to be honest. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's been interesting to see. I know uh, things in Australia haven't been very easy for people either. Lots of lockdowns and things like that. Yeah. And Christian's been, Christian's, I think, had it way worse than I have. He's been, basically in his apartment for a year and a half. Yeah. 
it's not been the best start to the decade. Yeah. Is it hard to be creative under those conditions? Oh, it, it's been an interesting trip on that front when the whole thing first started, because we, we've just recently lifted restrictions, but until then been living in some form of lockdown for like over a year. And at first it was very creative. I did a whole bunch of stuff when it first happened. I got like a vault worth of stuff from just recording at home. But then as the whole thing dragged on, it became much harder to be creative because of kind of, a, you know, an apathy or sort of set in basically, or kind of like a little bit of being kind of depressed about and frustrated about the whole thing, which kind of made it harder to be creative as it sort of dragged on mm. for sure. Yeah. I've been writing, I think I wrote quite a lot of songs in the last year. Um, yeah, I, I, I like it, but uh, my kids are home and uh, every, and my wife's been working here from home as well and studying. And so, you know, the actual physical thing of being able to do it, that's, there's a lot of thing, there's a lot of things brewing in my head, but uh, it's quite difficult to find the space and the time to do it. Mm. Yeah. So now that uh, the album is out, uh, are there tracks that are closer to your hearts than others? Well, uh, it's kind of asking, like, a parent, which, which is your favourite child? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think this ones that are, I like more than others. I, I don't know. I, usually the ones that I really love, I'm like, oh, I don't want to. I, I'm quite hesitant about recording them because they, they would never really turn out the way that I thought. There's one song on the record called Moon Gazer, which I wrote a really long time ago. Um, and then I was like, oh, so hesitant to record it because I think when you're in a band like ours, it, it'll never be like the way that you envision it when you write it. It, it tends to get, you know, it gets changed. It just, that's, that's what being a band is. And most of the time that's a positive thing. But I really love that song. It's probably, uh, yeah, my, my favorite track on the album too. Oh, okay, great. Um, what about you, Christian? If you had to put one, uh, I don't know. I mean, they're all they're all good in their own way. I feel particularly attached to this record because it was such a long gestation. I feel a success in getting all the songs finished and on the record. I mean, at certain points along the recording of this album, there's probably at least multiple times where we were like oh I don't know if we can finish the song for various reasons there was a lot of technical issues we had at certain points in the recording and other reasons so there was more than one point where each song was possibly going to be abandoned so the fact that they all got finished <laughs> and made it onto the record means that you know I have a special attachment to them because they 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 survived the process and made it to the album which is a good yeah. thing um I, I think I think maybe you know if I had to pick one a kind of uh, maybe ray gun, is that what we actually called it on the record? I can't remember. That is what we call it on the record. Okay, yeah, it was the working title. You know, maybe that one. I think that's uh, turned out really good. Um, quite layered, sort of. I hesitate to use the word, but in some places, by our standards, almost orchestral in some of the kind of the arrangement of things. And so, that's kind of a more epic track that I think turned out really well. Yeah. Yeah, so, considering we were maybe going to let that one go for a while. Yeah, I mean, was, that's the thing about this record, yeah, is that was, as we said before, we did the initial sessions for it in such a very short space of time and that we were left with a lot of loose ends. And so for some reasons, just musical and technical, it was a real challenge to, to get these songs sculpted and finished in a way that we were happy with. So, and, and you know, a song like Ray Gun or even Moongazer, there was a lot of things that we needed to do to get it to a place we're happy with. So I feel a, a real sense of achievement in that sense and that we managed to turn a lot of these very raw ideas into really good songs. Yeah. So if COVID was to disappear tomorrow, uh, what would the Datsuns plans be? Uh, we oh. would be on tour, I guess. Yeah, play some shows. With probably with every other band. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really planet. wondering how that's going to work. I guess maybe matinee shows will come back and maybe lunchtime shows. I don't know, because there's only so many venues. and um, There's less keep, now. Some of them are going keep getting rid of them. Um, and there's probably more bands than there are. There's a lot more bands than there are venues. So I don't know. There's a lot of people will want to tour. Uh, for their livelihood, but also just 
you know, <laughs> mental health. We, I think for us, we always intend and uh, mean to, when we are working on the songs, it's to play them in front of people. You know? It's, it's mm. this is perhaps of, uh, the first record where we had serious discussions though about, because uh, that's, as Dolph was saying, normally there's always the consideration about how we're gonna play this song live, but on this record, we was perhaps the first time we were like, let's not worry about that. You know, more so than other things. Let's just make it sound how we want without worrying if we can replicate that live. In other words, take out, bust out the mellotron. Yeah, or let's put, you know, five five layers of backing harmonies that we could never possibly do live. No, that's true. Yeah. Well, guys, yeah. uh, it's a great album. You should be very proud of it. And uh, it's been great to chat. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Thanks. Greg.